Hi everyone, and welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater, and I am the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts. And I'm excited to be joining you as we explore our third week exploring mark making. If you missed our previous weeks, uh, you can always check out all of our videos, whether you're watching this on Facebook, on YouTube, or on the artstarts.com website. We archive all of our workshops. So if you start making and you want to go back, you can go check those out. Uh, you can make in a sequence. You could finish making with me today, and then you could continue um, throughout the day by going back and checking out our previous sessions. Specifically, if you're really enjoying mark making, go back and check out our previous two sessions uh, from November. So if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Um, if you've been here before, you know what's coming up next. And those are the three rules of explorers. And we like to explore this together um, at the start of our sessions so that we are all kind of thinking in the same direction as we are making together or making uh, yeah, together today. Uh, the first uh, rule of explorers, and you can see I've put rules in kind of quotes here, because these are just things for us to keep in mind as we're making together. Um, the first is respect. And so we practice respect. Sometimes we're better at it. Uh, on some days we're better at it than others. Uh, but we practice respect um, by respecting ourselves, allowing ourselves space. If we're tired this morning, if we had a really great day, if we're hungry, uh, we might not be up to um, how we're normally making. We might need a bit more time. We might need a bit more space and that's okay, but we want to name that. We practice respect by doing the same thing for each other. And so if you're making with somebody else today, you might be feeling great, but they're having a hard time getting going or they're grumpy or they had a bad day or whatever it's going to be. And so using your words or your signs to communicate with each other how you're doing is a good way to practice respect. We're going to re practice uh, respect by respecting our tools. Um, so whether that means cleaning up when we're uh, all finished, which we want to make sure we do, using our tools safely, using communication to share those tools with each other um, as we make throughout the day. And then we practice respect by acknowledging and respecting the land that we're on. And so where you see my hands and you see my studio right now, my studio in particular is on the stolen or unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. And in particular, the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. And I am an uninvited guest while I am hosting these workshops. And so while I'm making, I want to keep in mind that I am a guest on these lands and I want to be respectful of the people who have been here since time immemorial and who are still here protecting the lands and the waters that um, I am privileged enough to have access to, to drink and to use while I am making with you. Oh, I picked up number three. Number two is that nothing is for keeps. And so you might be you might be used to making where everything that you make goes up on the fridge or you frame it afterwards, or you keep it in your sketchbook. But today we're gonna to try something a little bit different and this could be difficult for you. This might be the hardest thing that you practice today, which is nothing is for keeps. So everything we're trying today um, is going to be taken apart or is going to be thrown out or is going to be put away when we're all finished, um, which gives us the freedom to really try whatever. And so I always encourage that you take things out the recycling bin because that makes it easier to just throw out when you're all finished because it was already going to be thrown out. And again, to take it apart when you're all finished. So it's not something that we're making for keeps. It's not something we're going to keep at the end of this which really sets us up for no expectations. So if we have a picture in our heads of how something is going to turn out, sometimes we can be really frustrated when it doesn't turn out that way. So for these making sessions, I encourage you to throw those pictures out, throw those expectations out, and any idea that comes into your head, it's a good idea when we're making, when we're practicing respect. With all these other rules here, really we can practice anything. And it's another, uh, another good way of um, having no expectations is to practice surprise. So if you already know how something's going to happen, if you've drawn something a hundred times, don't draw it this way this time. Or if you're really good at drawing something, draw it badly this time. 
this is your freedom to, to really not have any expectations of yourself and see what happens when we just try things out. And so those are the rules of Explorers. Those are the things that we kind of keep in mind for every session before we start making um, so that we, uh, we're all kind of working from the same place. And now from that starting point, we can now deviate, we can now explore in so many different directions. So I'm going to move my sandwich board, my little host buddy over here to the side, uh, so we have a bit more room to make. And you know who I am now. You've been listening or reading my voice for a bit. And so before we get started, if you can find some paper, that's great. And remember I said grab from the recycling bin. It doesn't have to be perfect paper. It can be scraps of paper. Uh, it can be ripped paper. It can be paper that has already been drawn on and you're gonna use the back of it. Whatever you want to find uh, to draw on today is, is all good. I use white paper because it's got a high contrast so that you can see everything that I'm doing, but there's no reason why you couldn't use colored paper if that's what you have available. And then do you have a mark making tool? And if this is your first time making marks with us today, you might wonder what that is. And so if you have a pencil, you're good to go. You're ready to go. But a mark making tool is really anything that makes a mark. And so if you have pastels, crayons, chalks, uh, this is a, a twistable grease marker, pens, a Sharpie, whatever you can find, that's that's a mark making tool, anything that marks up the page. And so whatever's gonna be right for you is perfect. I'm gonna stick with my Sharpie just because it, again, I'm trying to go for contrast so that you can see things really clearly um, while I'm making, but, uh, but you don't have to copy me. You can copy me. I give you permission to copy me, no problem. But you should try whatever is gonna work for you. Okay, so for this third week of making for, uh, for mark making, we're gonna start out with something I like to call expressive mark making. And so expressive mark making is this idea that you can express yourself or you can express um, emotion or how you feel or your personality through a gesture, through your gesture. And so the idea that mark making is really, it's your arm. It's your body. And if you're not drawing with your arm, um, maybe you don't have uh, your arms. Maybe you're using your elbows or maybe you're using your mouth. And I draw right-handed, but maybe you draw left-handed. So there's lots of different uh, ways that this, this mark-making tool is an extension of your body, so an extension of you and how you use it as the start of that gesture. So now, however we're going to hold our mark-making tool, and that's, that's another way, you know, is your how you're going to express your gesture and how you're going to express yourself is do you how do you hold your marker how do you hold your mark making tool do you hold it as a grip do you hold it like you're writing do you hold it in your fist do you hold it loosely do you hold it tightly how do you hold your your mark making tool because it's an extension of your body you make that decision and you can start by just filling up a page by trying different ways of holding your pen. Maybe you've never tried that before. Find out what's really comfortable. Maybe you learned to do it one way and never really thought about trying it in a different way. Now's your chance. What's comfortable? What feels really good? You might be really surprised to learn that while you might always hold your pencil or pen like this, that this might be more comfortable, or this might be more comfortable, or stick it in your elbow. Maybe that's more comfortable. Who knows? And you won't know until you try. So if you want to keep practicing or testing out holding your mark making tool, go for it. But I'm going to pick holding it like this this week. So not a lot of control like I would normally do where my, my fingers are really far up the marker so I got lots of my hands to hold on to it. I'm going to bring my hands back here so that more of the mark making tool is exposed. And so I've really only got a little bit of control through my pinched fingers over here. And I'm going to see what happens. Okay, so we've made all of these decisions and we might have made a few scribbles on the page. But right now really all we've decided is how we're going to hold the mark making tool. Now let's decide what we're going to do um, through the extension of this. And so, sure, we could start drawing, but what I want us to do first is think of an emotion. Think of how we're feeling. 
So before, when we were thinking about um, practicing respect, we were talking about um, uh, checking in with ourselves. How do you feel today? If you feel happy, how do you draw a happy mark? How do you draw a happy mark with how you're holding on to your pen right now? If you're feeling grumpy or hungry or sad or excited or nervous, however you're feeling, can you draw that? What does it look like? Let's take a second and see what that could look like. Okay, those are some marks that I made when I was thinking about or trying to express being happy through my hand. What do your marks look like? Are they the same as mine? Are they thin lines or thick lines? Did you just draw a mark? Or did you draw a picture or a figure that made you think of what it is when you're happy? A lot of people, when they're trying to express themselves, will go for, and you can see I did it here, will go for a face because that's what a lot of people use to kind of determine or to uh, figure out or guess or take signals from people about whether or not they're happy or they're sad or how they're feeling, right? So if you see somebody who looks like this, you may have learned that a smile and um, neutral eyebrows means that somebody is happy. But for some people, they, they have to work really hard to learn that this means happy. Even though everybody's got a face, just because somebody has um, a happy face, somebody has a smile, doesn't necessarily mean that they're happy. But in general, we associate that happy face, that smile with being happy. But maybe you don't associate yourself being happy with that. Maybe it needs to be a big open mouth, you know, with the tongue exposed and the teeth exposed. That's, that's your idea of happy is laughing. And so a mouth showing the, the laughter is what it is. Maybe it's even more abstract than that. Maybe it isn't a face. Maybe it's just an upward curve that makes you think of a, a happy mouth right? And so all of a sudden that curve when taken out of context is just a mark that you make when you're happy. And whether that's you when you're drawing makes you think that you're happy, or it's a mark that we just, we associate with being happy that people when they see your drawing are going to go, this is a happier mark, rather than maybe this being a sad mark. And if you drew lots of things with those marks, could you express being sad by just drawing with those marks? Maybe being happy is really big to you. Maybe happy is um, a sound or a color or an explosion. And so maybe you drew something that was really, really big. Maybe it's associated with a, an event or um, a, a moment in time. So a memory that makes you happy. And so I drew a bunch of balloons here. And so maybe it was a party um, that I felt real happy at. Here, I wanted to add some color because this memory has some color associated with it. And so I'm expressing myself through mark making by adding color, but also by making these figures. I kind of feel like squiggly marks are my kind of happy as well. And that's where I was starting to go here, where I've got these big marks. It kind of looks like an exclamation mark maybe, but really I just drew those squiggly lines there and went, you know what, squiggly lines make me happy. I had these, these expressive lines here that came out, like the idea that if somebody was happy, they'd be so happy that they were beaming energy out. And I put a big heart. These were a couple of ways that I expressed being happy, but your marks probably look completely different. If you explored happy with me, let's try doing a different emotion. If you tried a different emotion first, like sad or however you're feeling today, maybe it wasn't happy. 
Now I encourage you to try happy. If you did happy, let's try something else. So I've got a bunch of a bunch of marks already on my page here because this was a recycled piece of paper, but that's fine because we're just trying things out. This it doesn't really matter. So we did happy. And you know what? I'm gonna write that down so that we can remember as we go along that this was happy. H A P P Y. And now I'm gonna do uh, you know what? I think Normally I would use sad because a lot of people consider that the opposite of happy is sad. But I think today I want to do sleepy. It's Saturday morning. Maybe um, you're feeling a little tired. Maybe you woke up a little bit late. Um, maybe you're somebody who likes to have a morning cup of tea. You haven't had that yet. And so maybe you are feeling sleepy. Um, so I want to kind of explore sleepy marks. So again, if you want to figure out how you're going to hold your mark making tool as an extension of your body, if you tried it one way the last time, you could try it a different way. What we did was we're changing the emotion, the way we're going to express ourselves though. So if you wanted to keep how you were holding the tool last time the same, but just change the emotion or the expression that we're trying to do, that's a good way of exploring as well. Okay, let's go for it. Let's try and express the, the, uh, the word or the emotion that we've chosen. Maybe you're choosing sleepy along with me. Let's go. Okay, so I only drew a few marks this time. This one was harder because I think that most of the time when people ask you to draw happy, there's lots of symbols or icons or pictures that people associate with being happy. Especially in North America, we put a lot of stock, we put a lot of weight, we put a lot of value on being happy, on telling people to smile, on how when we want to uh, get something or express something that we are supposed to smile. And so I think there are lots of icons and pictures that we can pull from if we're going to do that. But it's a little bit harder with sleepy because generally people don't tell you to be sleepy. And usually there's only a couple of, uh, of things that we see in public with other people being sleepy. Sleepy is usually a pretty private thing. It's something that we do before we go to sleep. And that's something that we usually do by ourselves. And so there are, so it can be harder. At least that's, that's how I'm reading it. Maybe when you were looking at the word sleepy, you could think of a lot of different ways to express sleepy. Let's look at some of my marks. So I went back to the face again, and I was thinking about the big yawn that I do when I'm really sleepy. I didn't even put teeth in this time. It was more just the shape of that big O. And I started with little, some little dots at the beginning, but I don't really feel like dots are associated with sleepy. I feel like the face that has dots for eyes are more alert. Their eyes are open. Whereas kind of those curved lines feels more like the face has been pushed up, your nose has been pushed up, and your mouth is really wide, which also pushes your eyes up so that they're kind of flat. And so I feel like those marks were a bit more sleepy marks, right? So just kind of that that crinkle, crinkled eye. Yeah, that, that feels like a sleepy mark. And then I put some Zs here. It's very often in comics, especially in English comics, that you'll see that the letter Z, it represents sleep. But look at that mark for a second, right? Have you ever done a Z this way? Right? No, it looks like a bunch of Ns. But it still kind of feels like sleep to me. It feels like somebody might be laying down and that's where the snoring is coming out. What about if it curved? Yep, that still feels like sleepy marks to me. 
that's going around somebody's body. Maybe they're sleeping so heavily that it's coming down to the ground. If this was, if this is gravity pulling it down. And so this is what felt like sleepy to me. I started to think about, um, again, about that whole idea of, of the Zeds traveling down, about being kind of heavy, also about it being kind of soft. Usually the word sleepy doesn't have some, doesn't have a negative, doesn't, doesn't feel bad. But if I was going to say so tired or exhausted, it might look something, it might look different. It might actually not actually have um, a soft curve. Maybe exhausted is more, maybe exhausted is just, right? So if you're done doing one sleepy, I mean, for happy, you could go excited or you could go elated. You could go overjoyed. Um, for sleepy, you could go tired. You could go exhausted. You could go nightmare. You could go in so many different directions just by exploring one one of the connected words uh, to how you wanted to express it. So when I was thinking about the down, I was also thinking kind of about soft and then about soft pillows. And so I started to kind of draw a pillow shape. And then it's the idea that there's a bed here and that I want to put my head down on this pillow. And then I thought about sleepy being something that usually is done at night. And so I started to do a moon here because I feel like um, I sleep better when it's kind of dark, dark outside or at least dark in wherever I'm going to be sleeping. And so I had all these reasons, I had all of these stories about why these lines, why any of these expressions were how I would express mark making. But your page probably looks really different. If you wanted to keep exploring different ways of expressing yourself, uh, whether that's using um, emotional or feeling words, or whether you wanted to just write your name and see if any gestures came along. Or if you wanted to write somebody else's name and see if any gestures came along. If you wanted to pick some nouns, you could do that. You can keep exploring expressive mark making for the rest of this session. And don't worry if you're still making. I'm gonna go on to um, another activity, but you can keep making uh, for as long as you would like to uh, by exploring expressive mark making. Okay. So next up, I want to do something called non-visual contour drawing. So this is a different kind of mark making. And so for these ones all over here, I was talking about how it was an extension of your arm. And so um, you were really using your gesture. You were really using how the pen moved around the page to express any of these ideas that you wanted to express. Non-visual contour drawing is kind of like that, um, where what we're going to do now is, is that we're not going to look at our pen. In fact, if you could come up with a different way or a mark making tool, um, if you can think of the way that was most comfortable for how your hand is going to sit, I encourage you to do that now. Because what we're gonna practice doing is, is that we are going to, um, we are not going to look at our page and that's what the non-visual is. We're going to look at an object and we're gonna draw what we see without looking at our page. You've maybe heard this called before blind drawing, but I don't really like that. I don't really like that term because I know a bunch of people who identify as blind or who have low vision. And this doesn't really, this doesn't really um, express how they draw or how they make mark making. In fact, if anything, this is almost a visual contour drawing, because we are going to use our eyes to look at an object. We're just not going to look at our page. And so I'm, I'm, I'm straddling the line by calling it non-visual, just because it is usually referred to as blind contour drawing. But really what we're doing is non-visual paper contour drawing, because we are going to look at an object. Okay. So the way that we're going to set this up is find an object, find any object. If you had multiple mark making tools, you could, you could look at uh, one of the mark making tools. You could put your piece of chalk or you could put another pencil over to the side. And that could be the thing that you're looking at. If you have um, a toy or a piece of fruit 
or a shoe or anything that you can pick up and you can bring over to your making area, grab it. If this is your first time doing non-visual contour drawing, I recommend that you pick something kind of simple just because this is your first time and you really want to, um, you really want to be able to explore and not have to get too detailed about it. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our paper and we're going to put some distance between the object that we're going to draw and the paper. In fact, the closer you can get your paper to your body, the better, because then you're not necessarily going to be able to look at your page. You might glance down every once in a while, but I really encourage you as much as possible not to look at your page, only to look at your object. All right. So once you've got your object, whether or not you want to hold on to it, whether or not you want to put it further far away from you, take a second and look at the object. Look at the shapes that you can see and then pick a point on that object where you want to start drawing. The reason where we start is important is because we're not going to be looking at our page once we put our pen down. So really deciding strategically where we're going to put our pen is helpful. But if you're exploring this for the first time and you just want to see what happens, go for it. You don't have to take any of my tips. Let's just see what happens. So I'm going to pick this point for me, so this corner, and where I'm looking at, which is going to be a different perspective from you because you're seeing down at my screen, maybe you're seeing this round shape, I can actually see something more like this, where I can see part of the shape up here, as well as the body down here, and the curve of the, of the perspective at the bottom a little bit smaller. So that's what I see. Whatever you're going to draw, or whether or not you want to draw, here, you know what? There's another glue stick. So if you want to draw the glue stick, there's a glue stick for you to draw, and I'll try and keep that really, really stable. I'm going to draw this glue stick, and let's see what happens. Remember, we're not looking at the page, so let's get started. Okay, so that's what I drew. And now I'm gonna look down in it and you can hear me laughing. This is one of the fun things again about non-visual contour drawing is that you can laugh at yourself, especially if this is your first time doing it because it's a, it's a skill, it's hard to not be looking at your page. What are some of the things you noticed when you started to draw, especially if you're looking at your drawing here? For me, startings and endings can be very, very difficult because you have to rely on your memory. And the further you, away you go from where you started, the more difficult it can be to go right back to where you started again. One of the other things that I find really difficult is when you have to go over lines again. So I tried to, um, you can see this is the cap up here. And so I tried to do the cap here. So this was supposed to be the top. I was going to draw this now looking at my page. Here we go. I'll put it right beside it so that we can look at what I was trying to draw. You can see how many times I'm lifting my pen off the page, so it's something a little bit different. So I was able to easily see where I started and ended because I can see my page. When I lifted my pen off and I wanted to create these different partitions, these different sections along the glue, I was able to gauge with my eyes, but also based on the shape that I already had here, make those decisions. I could look back and reference it, but really at this point, I could reference my drawing because I can see it. Here, we rely 100% on what we are looking at, on what we can see, and not over here. And so to go back on itself, if you don't have your pen exactly lined up, you might not get it lined up. You might have done a really good job. If you did, well done. I recommend that you grab something a little bit more complicated than a glue stick or whatever you drew the first time. Or draw your object again, but start to add in other details. So for this one, 
what would happen if I tried to draw the lines on the pen cap? Because the pen cap has a little bit of texture here. What if I tried to do the, the divot or the hole at the top of the cap? There are some triangle or sorry, some rectangle marks down at the bottom for the grip of where you grab the glue to move it around. And then there's a bunch of information on the label of the glue stick here. I'm just going to go all purpose glue stick because it's my big marker. And then there's some lines around the outside of it. And then this is the logo at the top. All right, so these are all these details that while I'm looking at it here, were quite easy to translate. I'm gonna start by cheating a little bit by putting my pen um, in the center where the dot is. And so that's where I'm gonna start. But now I'm gonna look up, I'm gonna see if I can do all of these same details by only looking at the object that I'm drawing. Let's go for it. There we go. <laughs> so my dot was where I wanted it to be. And you can see, you know, I wanted to, sh I wanted to um, put it so that it was kind of in the center where my cap was, even though the cap wasn't, wasn't perfect. And so my guess from here to here was pretty good, but I didn't, I didn't get far enough over to the side. I was really good for this one. Look at it, it's, it's even within there, but I didn't know how far over. And you can see, I kind of lined it up with where I had done the texture at the top of the cap. This one fell right off. And then the little details, well, I got them right as far as them stacked up on top of each other, but they didn't really fit in the label area and they're all kind of squished on top of each other. This is gonna be a really fun way to practice your coordination so how well you can look at a thing and translate it which can be really helpful when you're taking notes if you're listening or you're reading something off of a chalkboard and you're trying to write it down so that you can keep things really straight the more you practice it also life drawing if you have a figure or a person who's sitting and modeling for you the more times the more time that you can spend looking and translating that information rather than having to look and then look back at your page and then potentially lose your spot of where you were when you were looking at your model or looking at your page you can you can um, more easily translate information by not losing time by going back and forth from your page and your object you can keep doing non-visual contour drawing over and over again with as many things as you can find and i encourage you to do so because it can be really fun and it can be really funny as well as you go through and you get to check out what you and anybody else who's making with you, especially if you're making with some, uh, um, with, with people who are really good at drawing, it's going to be a fun way to loosen up so that you're not always comparing yourself to each other. This is just, this is, this is fun. This is practicing and exercising, and it's not about who does it the best, but about how much information you can translate from just looking at an object over to your page. We have a few more minutes left, and I want to look at one more different kind of contour drawing. And this one I feel is more accurate if you were ever going to call it blind con uh, contour drawing. And so this would be uh, blind or low vision where somebody is um, getting information based on their fingers, based on touch rather than what they see. And so, this is more in line with the blind people and, or people who are blind and uh, people who have low vision that I know, because a lot of those folks use their hands to navigate and get information. And so we're going to take um, a page out of their book. We're going to practice what it would be like to translate information to a page based on touch. And we're gonna do all the same things as we did for non-visual uh, where we were looking at the object and bringing it over and non-visually or not looking at our page. 
we're still not going to look at our page, but we're going to feel, we're going to look using our fingers. If you wanted to, to really challenge yourself, if you can see or um, you don't have, um, or if you um, are wearing corrective uh, lenses like glasses, you could take those off. You could blindfold yourself. You could close your eyes. That would be a great way of you really getting to uh, focus on the hand that is holding the pen and the hand that is touching the object. Remember how before I said some people don't necessarily have um, hands or arms while they're drawing? If that's you, or if you wanted to try and explore that, if you were using your mouth or if you were using your elbow with your pen, you could do that. You could try and feel the object you have not using your hands, but by using your wrist or by handing the object to somebody else and having them describe what they see or what they feel, then them translate it to you while you're not looking at your page and you take that information. So that's a whole nother level um, away from you looking at the page or looking at the object. So there's lots of ways that you could explore this. For me, I'm going to hold the object. I'm going to hold it in my other hand. So not the hand, my dominant hand, the hand that I normally write with. And I'm going to use that information that I get by holding or touching the object to draw. I'm also going to close my eyes to make it a little bit more difficult. All right, I'm ready to go. Let's see what happens. You try it as well. Okay, I'm gonna open my eyes. There we go. What do you notice that's the same between what I drew here and what I drew there? It's actually not that different, is it? I have to wonder because I already, I'm drawing something that I already had looked at, how much of that information I was taking from having looked at it before. And if I had taken an object that somebody had just handed to me while my eyes were closed, what kind of information would I get without any of that, that, inf that previous information, that history that, um, that I had already gotten in my memory? One of the things that I really noticed that was different when I was touching this versus when I looked at it is that the sticker or the label on my glue doesn't actually match up 100%, and there's a seam here. And I tried to draw that here. And I didn't get that by looking before. So I actually saw more. I got more information out of this by doing this, this exploration as well as looking. And so that can be a, a really great way of going back after you're done drawing something by, by just looking, by touching it to see what additional information you get. One of the other things that I noticed when I was when I was touching it versus drawing was over here, I felt like the rectangles really needed to be kind of by themselves. They, they, they jutted up against the label. When I touched them though, it really didn't feel like there was any ending between where the groove started and where they ended. And so because of that, I noticed that this space down here at the bottom doesn't, isn't actually interrupted by any of the rectangles. Also, by touching it, there's kind of a bump that comes out a little bit at the base, which I didn't draw 
on any of these pieces here. It's subtle, it's small, but I noticed it by touching it and I wouldn't have noticed it if I had just looked at it. My circle at the top was a little bit a little bit clearer, but I still couldn't I still couldn't get it to match up 100%, so that was still pretty hard. Oh, I also noticed that the hole up at the top it kind of feels like there are two holes here where the depression goes down into the hole and the hole on the outside where it curves in from the plastic. And so I made two holes this time when I drew it this time. So just by doing these three drawings, one where I was looking at the page and looking at it, doing one where I wasn't looking at the page, but I was looking at the object, and one where I was touching the object and not looking at the page or the object, how far apart are those? Don't they look like they're kind of connected? They could be the same object. What did you notice that was different about yours? If you did this again for a different object, what, would you, what did you learn by doing it this way that you would do differently the next time you do it? Thank you so much for joining me for week three of mark making. If you, uh, if you have permission from, um, from your grown-ups um, or you feel comfortable sharing, I'd love to see the different drawings that you made um, during these past three weeks or just today. If you can share them on any of our uh, social media sites on facebook.com slash artstarts or youtube.com slash artstarts, or you can email us. Um, my email is k at artstarts.com. I'd love to see any of the work that you do. You can also check out all of our previous um, Explorers workshops, as well as our downloadable um, activity uh, uh, resource page that we put out every month that goes along with our theme at artstarts.com slash explorers dash online. Thanks again so much for joining us for this month of Explorers. Next week, we will be in the Art Starts Gallery for a free performance for our Art Starts on Saturday performance series. Um, I will be in the chat so you can still keep chatting with me. Um, and then I will be back again in December for our next theme. So I, I can't wait to see you then um, and keep making throughout the, the rest of the month of November. Thanks so much. I'm going to keep the camera rolling for another five minutes like I always do while I clean up because we want to prioritize that and put the space back to uh, zero so that we can start again together with a fresh and clean space. Thanks so much. <laughs>